we'll come back to the physiology of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, at the beginning, I divided the topic, GI physiology, into two parts. A, a general physiology part and then a special physiology part. In the general physiology part, I've given a, a number of clinical cases to demonstrate um, to all of you the importance of studying GI physiology for us as, as clinicians. After that, we talked about a definition for the gut, and then I've talked about the different parts of the gastrointestinal tract, and then the different layers of the gastrointestinal tract, and then move to talk about the control systems that orchestrate the different functions of the gut, intrinsic and extrinsic, and then I've talked about the uh, intrinsic endocrine secretions, which included the five hormones. Then I moved and talked about the very first special uh, function of the gastrointestinal tract, and that was motility. I gave first general a uh, 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 facts about the, the motility in the gut, said that the contractile tissue is the smooth muscle cells. I've said that they are innervated by enteric neurons that contains vercosities. I also mentioned that they are connected a, um, electrically by what we call uh, nexuses. And then I've talked about two types of uh, uh, contractions, phasic and tonic. And then I talked about the mechanism by which this contraction uh, takes place. Uh, we have to have two requirements, an action potential from an enteric neuron and then a slow wave coming from the ICC, especially the plateau phase of the slow wave. That will make the, the, the um, contraction to take place uh, or to happen. Now, now uh, I moved to talk about the motility patterns in, in the different parts of the gastrointestinal tract. In the oral cavity, we have the, the uh, oral a, um, stage and the pharyngeal stage. Uh, we also have the a, uh, esophagus, which we have a primary, and sometimes we have secondary a, um, uh, peristaltic movements, and we do not have ICCs in the esophagus. Then we move to the stomach, and we said that we have a, um, 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 a antral pump and uh, a reservoir as the contraction, and we have gastric emptying as the uh, relaxation. Uh, then we talked about the intestine, small intestines and large intestines, and I mentioned that the MMCs are the uh, motility pattern or what generates the motility pattern during the interdigestive state, and, and that's a, uh, um, controlled by the gut hormone motilin, whereas in the, in the, um, in the uh, digestive state, when we are actively involved in, uh, in, uh, in uh, eating, uh, there, there will be no, um, no motilin, and therefore uh, uh, the MMCs will be replaced by other motility patterns. Uh, same thing with the, with the large intestines. However, we have also to consider the, uh, the different structural a, um, uh, uh, changes in the gut, in the in the large intestine uh, to accommodate their function, uh, mainly in in storing uh, food and also in microbial digestion. Then, after I talked about the gut motility patterns in the in in a, yes, the horse and the small animals, I moved and talked about. Uh, specific motility patterns in ruminants, in, in cows and, and sheep and, and goats and camel and deer and giraffe and, and all of these species, the ruminants. And I, I first gave you an, uh, an idea about the anatomy of, of the stomachs, which consists of four uh, uh, compartments, rumen, reticulum, omasum, and abomasum, and I mentioned how the the uh, the ruminal pillars basically play an an, an important role in um, uh, doing a, a uh, the receptor uh, uh, function from a chemical standpoint, chemoreceptors, and also from a stretch receptor uh, to to measure the volume or to gauge, if you will, the volume of, of food that the animal or the ruminant is is eating, and 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 I mentioned also. Uh, that 
uh, we have two cycles for the motility uh, patterns. We have the uh, yeah, uh, ruminoverticular and we have the omeso, abomasal. And then I mentioned to you how the food goes from the mouth uh, to the to the to the uh, reticulum and to the rumen, and then goes back to the mouth for uh, uh, erectation uh, to basically uh, do the rumination process. And and I mentioned that the uh, there are di two different motility patterns there. We have a primary contraction and we have a secondary contraction. The primary contraction is called also mixing, and with that you separate uh, the, 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 the contents, basically, based on the size. We have a slurry zone which have large particles, and we have a... Um, a, um, a uh, uh, zone of potential escape and that contains the the smaller particles and um, then we have the secondary uh, uh, contraction and with that it separates the uh, yeah, contents based on specific gravity and uh, contraction and we mentioned that we have gas we have liquid uh, and, and so on and so forth and and we also mentioned how uh, these uh, mechanisms um, are controlled uh, by the enteric nervous system, but also the vagus nerve um, uh, organizes the the uh, the uh, uh, coordination uh, of, of of these motility patterns. Coordinates them, makes them organized, uh, just just like the music. Make make the music flows. When you take that vagus out, uh, you still have the 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 musical notes, but they are not organized. So you will hear bad music. Basically, that's the same thing that happens with the contractions in the in the in the in the rumen. And then I ended up uh, talking about a number of clinical cases that are important in ruminants, such as RDA and LDA, uh, GRP, the, the hardware disease, bloating, uh, yeah, uh, and then uh, uh, vagal indigestion and, and, and other and other uh, uh, cases that are important in the clinic. So, so that basically a summary of, of what we've talked about so far in the past a, um, maybe 10 lectures. Um, now, in this lecture, I will talk about the second important part of special gastrointestinal physiology. I mentioned that the gut performs mainly four functions, digestion, secretion, absorption, and motility. We have talked about motility. In this lecture, we will talk about the second function of the gastrointestinal tract. The second uh, function uh, of the gastrointestinal tract uh, is gastrointestinal secretions. Before I will talk about the secretions, I will talk about the sources of these secretions. Where do they come from? What's the source of each of these secretions? And then I will talk about how important they are for the gastrointestinal tract. We have four sources of gut secretions. We have secretions coming from epithelial cells. We have secretions that are coming from the salivary glands. We have secretions that are coming from the stomach. And we have secretions that are coming from the pancreas and the liver. So, four sources of gastrointestinal secretions. We'll start with the first one. Epithelial secretions are three. We have water and electrolytes. We have mucus and we have special molecules. We will be talking about each one of them and how they are important in the gastrointestinal physiology. 
first, we will talk about water and electrolytes. So the water and the electrolytes are secreted throughout the gut, and their main functions are to liquefy and dissolve nutrients for the food that we consume, and then they form a reaction medium. When you have liquids, you have an easier way to produce chemical reactions. The, the, the fluids basically acts as a medium for those reactions, and they produce two main ions. First is the hydrogen ion, which we'll basically see later on that it'll, it'll participate mainly in, in, in forming the, the acid in the stomach, which is very important in converting a um, pepsinogen into pepsin to, 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 to digest protein. And then we have the bicarbonate uh, uh, molecule, which, which also is extremely important in balancing this acidity that, that is uh, produced in the, in, the, uh, in the stomach. And mucus does two functions. First, it lubricates, which means that it facilitates the movement of the food throughout the different parts of the gastrointestinal tract, starting from the mouth, going to the esophagus, and then to the stomach and to the intestine. In addition to this lubrication, a function we have also a protection function for the mucus later on I will be talking about two types of mucus absorbable and inabsorbable this mucus that's coming from the epithelial cells is a soluble mucus which basically forms a layer over the uh, food that's consumed which makes it protected from the different enzymes as well as from the different motility patterns. Uh, so, so these are the two functions for the mucus. Uh, the third secretion from the epithelial cell is the specialized molecules. The specialized molecules they help in the digestion and in the absorption of food, and we will be talking about them uh, pretty soon, uh, especially when we talk about the digestion and, and the absorption uh, uh, um, special functions of the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, the next organ in the gastrointestinal tract that secretes is the salivary glands. The salivary glands comes after the um, epithelial cells and they have a number of facts that we need to remember about them. But first let's talk about their structure. This picture shows a salivary gland, uh, we can see mucus cells that secretes mucus. They are attached to a basement membrane and also there are myoepithelial cells. The contraction of these myoepithelial cells will lead to pushing of the salivary secretions into the duct from the cells themselves. So we have cells in the salivary gland that secrete mucus. Sometimes there are cells that secrete serous secretions and sometimes 
some of the salivary glands, they have mixed types of cells that secrete mucus as well as serous secretions. In addition to these, we have the myoepithelial cells which pushes the secretion into a intercalated duct and then to the salivary duct. We have some examples that we need to remember about the salivary secretions. We have uh, the parotid gland, which is serous uh, uh, in type. We have the submandibular uh, salivary gland, which is a mixed uh, salivary gland. And we have the sublingual a, um, salivary gland, which, which is a mixed uh, salivary gland. When I, when I say mixed, I mean it gives both serous as well as mucus secretions, both in the same salivary gland. So the submandibular and the sublingual both are mixed. Now, the, there are a number of facts, a couple of facts that I, I would like to mention about the salivary glands, and, and, that, and, and these are The salivary glands, they have high permeability, meaning that they filter the fluids pretty quickly. That's why they are very active. And they have high vascularity, high blood supply, high blood flow. To the salivary glands. It is 20 times more than the blood flow to muscles. That is why they are highly active and they keep secreting all the time because they have high permeability and they have high blood flow, 20 times more than uh, muscles. The functions of the saliva, they help in digestion, they help in lubrication, and they help in protection, digestion, lubrication, protection. And I will explain each of these functions by the saliva separately. With regards to the digestion function of the saliva, the saliva contains amylase and lipase, the two enzymes that digest carbohydrates and fats, respectively. Amylase digests carbohydrates and lipase digests fat. They are both present in the saliva and both of them participate in the digestion process. It is also worth mentioning that the amount of the digestive enzymes in the saliva is not large compared to the amount of digestive enzymes in the pancreas and other organs. So, although they secrete amylase and lipase, the amount of amylase and lipase are not significant in the digestion process, which means that if they do not exist, and when that, with that I, I don't mean don't exist completely, uh, no, but I, I mean significantly reduced uh, is, is a better term uh, for that. The digestion of sugars, 
meaning carbohydrates and fat, will still take place. So this is very important. The other two functions for the saliva are lubrication and protection. The saliva lubricates because it contains mucus and mucus basically lubricates the food material which makes it easier to pass throughout the different parts of the gastrointestinal tract mouth to esophagus esophagus to stomach stomach to small and then to large intestine if there was no mucus the food will be hard to move throughout these structures saliva also plays a role in protection in protection against bacteria or microorganisms for example because they have a diluting effect because they are secreted all the time 24 7 they dilute all the harming material that we sometimes ingest bad food that is contaminated bad vegetables or fruits that we eat without cleaning they are covered with with different organisms the saliva plays a role in diluting the effect of either these organisms that we we, we have or their toxins that they secrete the saliva dilute these 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 effects also the saliva it plays a bactericidal effect because they have lysozymes and lactoferins and a uh, bactericidal means that the saliva is able because of these lysozymes and lactoferins able to kill bacteria you will find the other term that's used in these lectures and it's called bacteriostatic which means that it stops the growth of the bacteria but it does not kill it the saliva kills bacteria it's a bacteriocidal now what are the composition of saliva what do saliva consist of the saliva consists of two components an organic component and an inorganic component organic and inorganic component so let's talk about the first one first and that is the organic component of the saliva the organic component of the saliva consists of digestive enzymes we just mentioned two of them lipase and amylase one that digests fat and the other digests carbohydrates the other component is mucus glycoproteins that's another organic a uh, uh, component of the of the saliva lysozymes like lactoferins we just mentioned their their role as well in killing the 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 bacteria calicrin it converts a plasma protein to bradykinin which is a vasodilator this protein is very important for vasodilation increasing the lumen of the uh, blood vessel uh, to increase the blood supply to or the blood flow to an area these are the organic components of the saliva digestive enzymes lipase and amylase mucus glycoproteins lys lysozymes and, and lactoferins which kills bacteria and calicrin which converts a protein in the plasma to bradykinin which is a vasodilator to increase the blood flow to to organs so this is the organic component of saliva what's the inorganic component of saliva the inorganic component of the saliva are different 
ions like chloride, sodium, potassium, bicarb. All of these are present in the saliva and all of them are increased during a meal. Let's look at, at how does that happen or, or a, a graph uh, to show us what, what exactly happens. So these are two graphs in, uh, uh, beside each other. The, the first one to your left is uh, the amount of these enzymes in the saliva. And the graph on the right hand side is uh, these uh, ions in the plasma. So the left is in the saliva, the right is in the plasma. And the different enzyme, uh, the different uh, ions you can see, sodium, uh, uh, bicarb, chloride, and potassium, can see that also th they increase with the meal. They, the flow increases with the meal. Uh, you, can, you can see that. And then, uh, and then the, the concentrations of these also is represented in the plasma. So the line basically reflects what's happening in the saliva for these ions. So the red circle on the sodium represents the red circle in the, the, beside the bar uh, in the second graph. And the chloride is increasing, the same thing, the chloride is increasing. The bicarb is being, basically being stable. Again, in the plasma, it's being stable. The only one that, that, that's, that stays low all the time is, is potassium, uh, the K+. plus. So, so we have to, to, to remember that sodium increases, uh, bicarb increases, chloride increases, potassium stays the same in the saliva. Now, how does the body regulate salivation? Salivation is regulated centrally in an area in the hindbrain, brainstem, basically, and it's either increase the amount of salivation or decrease the amount of salivation. Different factors basically play a role in doing so. The factors are divided into two parts. There are physiological and there are neuronal factors that stimulate salivation. And there are physiological and hormonal factors that inhibits or inhibit salivation. First, I'm going to show you where this area in behind the brain is on the brain stem, and then, and then I'll show you how does saliva increase or decrease. This is an area that shows the brain stem and the areas in the hind brain, which is the lower part, have different colors, brown, purple, yellow, etc. So from the front, and you have two little circles that are in purple, it's called the superior and inferior salivatory nuclei. Superior and inferior salivatory nuclei. These are the nuclei that regulate, stimulate and inhibit salivation. So how does this thing happen? This is a cartoon that shows what's going on in the uh, stimulation of salivation or inhibition of salivation. So the plus sign means these factors stimulate salivation, and that's on the left-hand side, on the top left-hand side of the picture. 
versus the right hand side, top right hand side of the picture, which shows the factors that inhibit uh, salivation. So this is the first part of the a, a, uh, uh, mechanism or the, the pathway. So chewing food will increase saliva production. Taste, if the, the food tastes, tastes good, that's the same thing. If you smell something pretty appealing, again, it increases saliva. Uh, condition, reflex, and nausea also increase the saliva before, before vomiting and stuff. Uh, saliva starts to increase. The factors that inhibit uh, saliva production are sleep, fatigue, dehydration, and fear. These are the factors that inhibit the saliva production. When you have activation of the superior and inferior salivatory nuclei in the medulla, which is kind of part of the hindbrain, they it activates parasympathetic nerves 9 and 7. Cranial nerves 9 and 7, which will release acetylcholine. If there was a sympathetic activation at the superior cervical ganglia, which releases norepinephrine, or nor adrenaline. Both of these, nor epinephrine or nor adrenaline and acetylcholine (ACH), will increase cyclic AMP in the salivary gland, which will increase inositol triphosphate which will increase calcium. All of this will result in increasing secretion and the myoepithelial cells in the salivary gland that I showed you earlier will start to contract and the blood vessels will start to dilate and saliva will be secreted. All of this takes place after you activate or inhibit the superior and inferior salivatory nuclei in the medulla through parasympathetic or sympathetic activation you increase cyclic AMP and increase calcium, which basically increases the secretion and contraction of the myoepithelial cells, etc. This is a very simple cartoon or pathway if you understand it. Parasympathetic or sympathetic will increase cyclic AMP and increases calcium, so secretions will be increased. There are factors that will increase it in the central nervous system, meaning central activation directly, not peripheral, central, and those are chewing, taste, smell, nausea, etc. And there are factors that will inhibit salivation, and these are sleep, fatigue, a, uh, you know, dehydration, fear, etc. So, so far we've talked about two types of secretions the epithelial cell secretion, and then the salivary gland secretion. The third type of secretion is the gastric secretions. So now we'll move to the gastric secretions. The gastric secretions are four, hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen, mucus, and intrinsic factor. Again, 
there are four gastric secretions hydrochloric acid, pepsinogen, mucus, and intrinsic factor. We will be talking about their physiological importance momentarily. Hydrochloric acid from the parietal cells, it converts pepsinogen to pepsin, which is again important in the digestion of protein. Hydrochloric acid is also bacteriostatic. It stops bacterial growth. This is unlike the mucus, the salivary mucus, which basically has a bactericidal effect. This is a very important difference between the salivary secretion of mucus, which contains lysozymes and lactoferins, it's bactericidal, it kills the bacteria, whereas the hydrochloric acid in the stomach stops the growth of the bacteria. It's bacteriostatic. The stomach also secretes pepsinogen, which is converted to pepsin by hydrochloric acid. And this is, this is the first line of enzymatic digestion for protein digestion. The stomach also contains mucus for protection, lubrication, and also it works as a barrier against any harmful effects. The mucus here We'll, we'll be talking about it. Uh, it's, it's two types. Uh, it's soluble and insoluble. And here it's very important to remember the most important thing about it, and that's the insoluble part or the insoluble mucus that's the stomach uh, secreted is very important in the protection against gastric ulcer formation. Very important. The last secretory product in the stomach is an intrinsic factor which binds vitamin B12. Intrinsic factor. Therefore, the animals that does not have intrinsic factor must be supplied with vitamin B12. Now, let's talk about the divisions of the stomach. We have the parietal cells and we have the pyloric cells. These are two regions, basically. To simplify things, one of them is in the, or three, three regions, I should say, fundus, body, and antrum. Fundus, body, and antrum. Each area secrete special secretions. These are the secretions in the fundus. It has about 80% oxentic glands, acid-producing cells, parietal cells. In humans, you have intrinsic factor producing parietal cells. In other species, the intrinsic factor is secreted from the chief cells. You also have in the fundus pepsinogen from the chief cells or the peptic cells. And there are other types of cells. So you have basically in the fundus acid-producing 
parietal cells, intrinsic factor producing parietal cells in humans, these are chief cells, and the pepsinogen also comes from the chief cells. In the antrum, however, the pyloric glands are about 20% and they are the cells that produce gastrin, the gastrointestinal hormone gastrin that is secreted from the G cell and it increases gastric acid secretion. Very important stomach hormone. Also, we have the uh, mucus cells. Production of the hydrogen ion in the stomach is very important, and it's very important because first it is utilized to produce hydrochloric acid and also by carbs through an exchange project with potassium and the bicarb exchanges with chloride. That's how hydrochloric acid is produced through a reaction controlled by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. Another important fact about gastric acid secretion is that acid is always present in the stomach. So whether you or the animal is actively involved in eating or not, acid is present. However, you have two levels. You have one that's basal, that's when you are not actively involved in eating. No GI stimulation. And this is highest in the evening time, especially in humans. And again, it's inhibited by vagotomy. Remember selective branch vagotomy that we utilize to, to, to reduce uh, uh, gastric acid secretion so it can, it can, it can uh, treat gastric ulcers. Enterectomy, the same thing, or H2 antagonist, the, the histamine 2 blockers, uh, uh, Tagamet, Zantac, Rhinitidine, Cyanamitidine, all of these, uh, they, they basically work on the same mechanism. And you have the actual level of, of, of hydrochloric acid, which is basically during the digestive state, the digestive state. This is basically the uh, type of a, uh, ions that the stomach secretes uh, during, during uh, the, the both stages, interdigestive and also the digestive. So, so the hydrogen ion continues when you don't eat anything, there's very little, so you have it very low and it increases when you start eating it increases when you start eating whereas sodium decreases when you start eating uh, chloride is always high in the gastric secretions and that's why when there is high levels of secretion of the hydrogen ion it always binds with the chloride ion because it's always high and it does give you the hydrochloric acid that uh, is needed for the digestion. So, so these levels depend on the amount of food that you are eating or um, how actively you are involved in eating. So if you're not eating, they have to be low, which means that the hydrogen ion is low, potassium is always low, and then sodium 
is very high and chloride is always high. Now, when you start eating and you start needing those ions for digestion, hydrogen immediately climbs to the top, increases so it can bind with chloride to form hydrochloric acid. And that's when you start converting pepsinogen into a uh, pepsin. That rates of secretion that I just talked about is referred to as the two component theory. The two component theory. So non parietal and parietal. Non parietal and then parietal. At the basal level, you have, which is the non parietal source, you have the sodium chloride. Sodium chloride. Why? Because chloride is always high. And at the very basic level, in the previous graph, sodium is pretty high at the very base. So sodium basically goes with, uh, with the chloride to form salt, which is NaCl. In the parietal uh, 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 level, of course, it's going to increase uh, the, the chloride, the, the, um, the hydrogen ion, I'm sorry. It increases to bind to um, uh, chloride to make hydrochloric acid to convert pepsinogen into pepsin and sodium goes down at the end at the uh, when you when you're actively eating and needing it for digestion goes always with the one that's very low all the time and that is the potassium so this is the none the two component theory which means that the 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 source of these uh, ions is basically two uh, uh, come from two components, an unparietal cell and a parietal cell. Th that's that's the, the two component, uh, basically, uh, uh, part um, of it. Okay, now we'll talk about the, the uh, characteristics of, of gastric acid secretion. Characteristics of, of gastric acid secretions. Uh, as as I showed you in the in the graph previously, and I've talked about it, it's mostly meal dependent. So, because all of these ions are meal dependent, so so you start with with very low hydrogen ion when you don't need any hydrochloric acid for digestion. That's before you eat. Now, when you start eating, the level of hydrogen ion starts to increase to go and bind with the chloride which is always high in the stomach the chloride ion is always high in the stomach so hydrochloric acid immediately binds to to uh, to um, uh, i mean the hydrogen ion uh, meets the or binds to the chloride to form hydrochloric acid that's that's how it's meal meal dependent on the basal level sodium is always high and uh, uh, chloride is always high at the very basic uh, level so sodium and chloride forms uh, NaCl, which is basically at the basal level, uh, continues to be at the basal level. Uh, there is some some uh, hormonal and or neuronal uh, control for gastric acid secretion, and and by now we know which hormone is is controlling this business. It's gastrin. We've talked about it when we talked about the intrinsic endocrine secretions that control gut functions. This is one of them is gastrin that comes from the G cells and neuronal we also know what nerve is basically controlling this process it's the vagus nerve because we do selective branch vagotomy when we treat gastric ulcers to reduce gastric acid secretion so gastrin and the vagus are are pretty important players here and and of course uh, acid does not match uh, uh, gastrin level uh, uh, it, it, it does not it does not have to match a gastrin level because the acid comes from different sources and it's food dependent and, and things like that unlike unlike the the uh, uh, you know or a hormonal uh, control as well so so that's why it does not match the the gastrin uh, level and it's always there is a, a place for potentiation or increase in the in the uh, in the uh, acid secretion or in the uh, amount of acid uh, being secreted in the stomach uh, 
uh, depending on depending on the type of food and depending on the time of the type of uh, stimulation and things and things like that so so that's that's a very important thing the meal the meal is the most important stimulus for all for all of this so so let's see how how does the meal uh, uh, work on that basically Um, this is a, a graph that shows you, uh, you know, the beginning of a meal and then how many hours after the meal is about four hours after the meal. And then the amount of, of uh, gastric acid secretion uh, uh, released in the stomach or secreted in the stomach, depending on that meal. That's how it's meal dependent. We can see that when the meal, when, when you eat the meal, the, it's, it's the highest amount of, of uh, uh, gastric acid secretion that increases and, and the pH becomes becomes sky high basically because the acid is is is, is pretty uh, uh, pretty high acidity so the number is basically in the two to three and as I mentioned uh, earlier that uh, you know you need you need a, a pH of 2.3 at least in horses uh, you need a pH of 2.3 to to convert the pepsinogen into into pepsin um, now, the, uh, after after the meal is started to be digested, the the amount of hydrofluoric acid starts to decrease and decrease and decrease all the way until it reaches the very minimum at the four hour level. If you remember the slide on gastric emptying that when I talked about motility, gastric emptying basically I said it, it can go up to eight hours to empty all the stomach. So this is about four hours, which which the majority of the uh, um, a um, stomach contents are are uh, being being emptied. We have seen this slide before and how we can control gastric acid secretion, how we can treat the uh, hyperacidity to prevent gastric ulcers. We've talked about the source of it uh, coming from the parietal cell, which is the top cell in this in this picture. The bottom cell is the interchromaffin-like cell, which secrete a, a histamine. And we know that histamine, if it binds to the histamine 2 receptor on the parietal cell, it will stimulate acid secretion, which is basically shown by the hydrogen ion at the very top of the, of the, of the, of the picture uh, there. So the way we can, and, and also the other ways to, to, to increase the acid secretion or the hyd hydrogen ion <clears throat> uh, levels is basically through gastrin. If gastrin binds to the CCK2 receptor, remember they, 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 they both share the same receptor, which is the CCK2 or the CCKB receptor. Gastrin and CCK share that receptor. It also it also uh, increases hydrogen uh, ion secretion from the parietal cell. And the third uh, one that um, uh, stimulates parietal cell to secrete hydrogen ion is acetylcholine coming from the vagus nerve. So these are the three stimuli that, that actually stimulate the, the parietal cell to secrete or to increase the secretion of hydrogen ion, either gastrin or histamine or acetylcholine. We can block them by a CCK2 receptor blocker or a histamine 2 receptor blocker or cutting the vagus or part of the vagus. You don't want to cut the whole vagus. You cut what I called before selective branch vagotomy. The other, the other method that I told you about before is a surgical procedure to remove the part of the stomach that actually secrete the hydrochloric acid. This is this surgery that you've seen Bell wrote one at a, a technique and that is an interectomy uh, but it's it removes only the, only the antrum only the antrum on the this is the left hand side picture only the antrum that secretes gastric acid so you remove it and you reduce the the, the, the size of the um, of the stomach just like what we do when, in, when we do the, the procedures to uh, reduce body weight. We call them a Y gastric bypass, if you remember. We've talked about that when I talked about CCK. Ruin Y gastric bypass. 
the the picture to the to the right we've seen it before also and that's selective branch vagotomy we see where the ulcer is located and we see the branch of the vagus that supply that uh, area and we cut it this is basically another picture of a um, a um, uh, uh, of cutting parts of the of the vagus to to uh, basically treat uh, gastric acid uh, uh, secretion. Uh, next, I will be talking about the control of gastric acid secretion. Before, uh, in uh, in the Next lecture, I will start talking about the control of gastric acid secretions and the different phases that regulates these uh, secretions.